<laughs> Getting well, everybody knows that it's common knowledge. So something's going to happen to try to redress that problem. Has to. All the Western democracies of the world. So there's there's going to be a problem. That will have to be resolved. All right. Anyway, this isn't about knowledge. It's about clobber. Very depressing. Anyway, those are the funded lines. Uh, how many AUs is the solar system diameter? 30 is a good guess because it's 30 AU from the Sun to the to Neptune, but that's just part of it, isn't that's it? That's half. That's half of it. Yeah. yeah. So the total so is 60. 60. 60. That's what you're going to say. 60 AU. 30 AU goes out to Neptune and then you go. And the Kuiper belt is out beyond the 30 AU. And offhand, I'm, I'm not sure of the extent. Uh, I have to look that up. It might be uh, 50 AU. I'm not sure. I'd have to look up the Kuiper belt extent. I know that the heliopause is about a layer away. Well, heliopause is way out there. Yeah. That's not the Kuiper belt. So heliopause, basically, heliopause is, uh, if you think about the uh, you know, near stars and stuff like that. Heliopause is basically halfway up near stars. Huh? Is that just the time to hit the system? Yeah, okay, so there's material and this is a kind of a magnetic influence. Okay, good good point. Uh, all right. Uh, oh oh I see for this one. Uh, yeah, that's true. You, that's right. So uh, 60 AU is really, that's probably a good measure, but uh, there's a Kuiper belt, and that might go 50 AU out, 100 AU across. Uh, if you include the Oort cloud, it goes farther out still. I think that's your point. You have Oort cloud, you have the helios. What was it? It's the distance uh, from Earth to the sun. There, yeah. Helio pause at the edge of that. That's way out there on the order of light year or so. Uh, all right, that's a good point. Uh, how many light years to the nearest star? About four. How about to the center of the galaxy? From which? I don't know. From us. Uh, yeah, from us. Uh, yeah, from, yeah, to our, uh, uh, our galaxy. Yeah, so that's six. Six, uh, it turns out it might be 6,000 or so parsecs or a little bit more. Light year is a little different. We're about 25,000 out. So we're about half, halfway out. To, uh, and the center is about 25,000 light years. Okay, I say K light year, 25,000 K is a kilo. How about to the Andromeda galaxy? 2.3 million? Yeah, two, yeah, between two and three, I would say on the order of about two million light years. Two million. How about all the way to the edge of the universe? The edge of the observable universe. It really depends how you how you think about it. Yeah, if you if you look if if you what I was saying is basically how far you can see before you run into opaqueness. So it turns out to be about 14 billion and the nine light years. And uh, light takes uh, a year to travel a light year. And so when you look out Say if you look out to let's see, do we talk? Well, we'll get down to here. But if you look out uh, to the edge of the universe, that's light that has been traveling for this many years. So it's light that is. I don't know if you would actually say it's 14 billion years old. That's one way to think of it. But it was emitted 14 billion years ago. So what you're seeing is the way the universe was not the way the universe is, okay? because 
you're seeing it from basically it's almost like a not a time machine but it's sort of like a historical kind of record you're looking back uh, the farther out you go it's a, you see it's kind of historical record in the same way that geology is a kind of time capsule uh, maybe in the sense of how far down you go yeah. uh, so how far out you go and therefore you can determine things about how things evolve does that mean every couple of years or few years or whatever we can observe more in the galaxy or the whole every universe? Few years, what? So like every, I don't know, maybe like 10 years, is it possible that we could see more? Out well, past? we're always, since the, gal since the galaxy is ex expand, and I mean the, the universe is expanding, the light is going out farther. So if you, if we have a, uh, an infinite universe, it can just go on forever. Uh, if we have a finite universe, a closed universe like Einstein, I see, um, then we can only see so far until we see the back of our head. <laughs> so if our sun just disappeared, we wouldn't know anything of it for like eight minutes? Okay, let's go down here. Let's jump. <laughs> let's jump down here. Yeah. How long does it take the light to reach from the sun to Earth? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. You say goodbye, you know, yeah. before we die. <laughs> so uh, then to Neptune. Four hours. Yeah, about four hours. Let's say if it's 8.3 minutes times two times 30, 250, about 250 minutes, which is about four, a little over four hours. Near a star. Four years, it's four light years away, roughly speaking. So I think we've answered that some place on the Earth. Yeah, so that nearest star, that four light years is a distance, I mean, it's distant. But then the time it takes, well, it takes one year to travel each light year. So we got four years. So when you look up at the night sky, you see the stars and you see all that stuff out there, and that's the way it is, except for the planets, which is the way things look uh, within an hour or you know, a few minutes, or you know, not a few minutes, but say less than an hour from the near planet. Uh, it looked this, that's the way that stuff looked some time ago, years ago, for stars. And uh, let's see, okay, maybe I'll ask a couple other questions here. Maybe I can ask uh, real quick, I, I, I think we might have discussed, how, how far, uh, when we look at the night sky, how far are those stars away from us, roughly speaking? Did, did, did I mention that last time, or does anybody know? Turns out we just see the near neighbors, we don't see all the way to the center of the galaxy. Uh, even if we wanted to, it's largely obscured by dust in the visible uh, region of the, the uh, spectrum. Uh, so we see, you know, say Sirius is nine light years away. Um, a lot of, this, most of the stars we see maybe within 100 or 200 light years. Some are a little bit farther, but, but very few that we can see with our naked eye. Of course, the brighter the stuff is out there, the absolute brightness, and the farther we can see that light shine, according to our naked eye, we can only see so far. So far. Okay, we're getting over a couple. How wide is the Milky Way in light years? Speak up a little bit. 100,000, that's right. 100,000, good. Okay, that's 100,000 light years across. The radius is basically about 50,000 light years, and again, we're halfway out, or about 25,000 25, light years. And what's the speed of light in kilometers per second? Three, two, ten. Three times ten to the fifth kilometers per second. Yeah, say that again. Three to the ten, I mean, three times ten to the fifth power. That's right, that's right. And yeah, 300,000. <laughs> 
kilometers per second. Three times 10 to the eight meters per second if you're still in time. In physics, we would talk about the meters per second or kilometers. All right. <coughs> See, that's pretty good. I'll propose two, uh, two examples of how a theory might be tested so that you can see uh, some contradiction in what might one might expect from a, a one model, and so you have to adopt or adopt some or modify your model or adopt some new model. Uh, one is uh, dark matter. Now, I don't think, you know, I don't, I don't know. Oh, I wonder. Now, it'll take too long to try to find it. Let's see. We will study orbits of planets later. And uh, uh, things, say, if you have a planet, going around the sun, uh, it it's, it's at some distance from the sun, and the velocity turns out to be something like uh, g m over r. I take the square root. g is a constant. Here's the mass of the sun, and here's the distance you are from the sun. So the farther you go out, the less speed there is in the orbit. Now you can take that same idea, that it, well this is basically a, a Keplerian uh, behavior. Um, Kepler, and he studied orbits and he came up with laws about orbits. He really is a, re is a remarkable tour de force. Uh, his mentor, uh, Tycho Brahe, was a uh, aristocrat, very wealthy. He was wealthy enough to build an observatory on some island. And so he would spend <laughs> nights. I guess he had. If you're bored, I guess you don't have much much things to do. Maybe at night. I don't know. Unless you're playing music or something. But anyway, uh, no TV back then. Uh, so he he made very precise observations of planetary motions of stars and how they. Uh, so uh, Johannes Kepler took those things and studied them in detail and inferred from the motions and all the data uh, that orbits were elliptical uh, and uh, the closer uh, an orbiting object came to the, uh, say, the sun, the faster it went, the farther away it was slower, and that there was a certain relationship between the period of the orbit and uh, the distance. So this Keplerian behavior can be applied to anything like a galaxy. So a galaxy, you would expect, you know, the, the mass is not all concentrated in the center, it's sort of distributed throughout. But uh, basically, if you look at the velocity that you would expect in a galaxy, You have something like something like this, and this is expected. That's based on the Keplerian viewpoint. Uh, so that's the prediction. That's the theory. Now you want to test the theory. So uh, Vera Rubin, uh, maybe an astronomer, maybe it was in the 1950s or so. I'm not sure exactly when she. Uh, looked at the speed of stars as they went far out in the Milky Way and other galaxies uh, and found that the velocity didn't come down like that. It sort of stayed like this and even increased. Now if you said that, well, you say the data must be wrong. That's one possibility. And that is a possibility. You always have to verify that you're doing a good job with your data. So you talk to different people and see if they can confirm what you see. 
But if, it's, if the data is okay, then there's, so, so there's the observation. And the model that you use to make predictions. So if this is okay, then this would say the model's wrong. What's the model? Keplerian behavior and beta, either, either Keplerian behavior is wrong, so the, the law of gravity might be wrong. So it could be, is gravity wrong? Or is it say Newton's gravity? That's a question mark. Or is the amount of mass? So she had to compute the amount of mass. And you can only compute based on what you see. Uh, so you can see there's certain density and this kind of thing. And uh, so based on the bright matter, uh, this was based on bright matter. And so there was a great, so, so the, the speed is higher, so there must be, since this, you, you know the distance, that's easy to see, then your estimate of the mass must be wrong. So there must be some extra <coughs> matter that's not bright. It must be dark, so I can't see it. So the, there's a, the discrepancy then was attributed to uh, extra stuff that you don't see called dark matter. The name dark matter really came from the studies uh, in the 1920s, I think it was, um, by I think their name, so by the name Wiki, I think it was, who studied uh, galaxies and clusters, and uh, the same kind of thing happened where they were going too fast. Galaxies were going too fast, so there must be extra matter, something that's dark matter. In People have been looking for dark matter ever since. So there's one case where you have, here's a uh, clear prediction based on bright matter. The observation is different. If you, so if observation is not wrong, then, then you have a, a model that needs to be modified. How are we expecting to find dark matter if we can't see it? Well, that's the thing. You have to infer. You have, to, you have, you have a choice. You can give up the laws that give you this result. You can say, oh, the laws don't work on a big scale. They have to be modified. Some people believe that is the reason we are inferring dark matter. It's not really dark matter. It's just that there are models of gravity are wrong. They're in a vast minority, and people think of that more on the fringe. Um, it's, not it's not necessarily incorrect. Okay? The greatest minds in history are all on the on the fringe until people figured out oh they were right so it doesn't mean just being on the fringe doesn't mean it's wrong but they're probably being on the fringe is wrong more of the time than it's right uh, so you don't know so uh, but but people these things are kind of they're so well uh, so well understood in so many circumstances in particular not only Newtonian but Einstein's theory. The theory of general relativity. They're so well established and they predict so many things over all this last century that and it's never been refuted in any other circumstance. Why would it suddenly be refuted in this circumstance? It's easier to think that we're missing math. Um, so it's just we just base this on an inference. So we and and a choice. Now, so here we we say the model, not the model structure. That's not what's wrong. It's just the the observation of the matter is incomplete. So we have an incomplete matter kind of observation based on brightness. It must be dark stuff that we're not. And we can't account for it in, the, in a normal way that you might, oh, well, it might be planets. It might be dark, you know, brown dwarfs that we can't see. It might be neutron stars. It might be black holes. 
And some people think, by the way, that it's a promising idea is that, uh, um, in fact, we talked about dark matter, there's also dark energy. Uh, people think that uh, primordial black holes may be responsible for a lot of this stuff. That we can't see it, but people are coming up with new models of how things, how black holes evolved over history. So that might, that's a possibility. Other people think it's some exotic form of matter. Uh, another one we'll, we'll confront in this course a little bit is to say the uh, say global temperature. So I'll just give you a flavor of what's happening here. Uh, say this might be is the temperature anomaly anomaly I think it's cold cold day maybe uh, and basically uh, the temperature the global temperature has been changed out just roughly sketch what people are seeing right around here we had a, a El Nino and then uh, it's been coming down here and something like this and then we had another big El Nino. And then we're sort of coming down like this. Now this is the satellite data. Okay, so that's, you're comparing that uh, to uh, theoretical models. Well, if you run, apparently if you run the theoretical models, you know, later in the term, maybe I'll bring, see if I can bring up some picture that uh, you can see. Uh, the, you say there, the theoretical models have various fudge factors. You choose the fudge factors to try to, how could I say? Uh, Make it work in your favor. <laughs> <laughs> you could say it that way, but uh, it, it, it's various, various it's, it's, it's a kind of a phenomenological approach to something that's too complicated. So people don't understand what's happening in the ocean. Or they don't even account for the ocean altogether. Well, they, 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 they basically, it's they have to make some kind of simple, gross simplification to get some answer. Otherwise, too complicated. Don't have enough computing power in the world to get. Uh, in other words, you can't go into detail of all the chemistry. Right? You just can't do it. But uh, there, there's a fudge factor for this and a fudge factor for that. Maybe the most important fudge factor. As far as we're concerned, it's a carbon dioxide fudge factor. Uh, and so it's a certain sensitivity. Uh, and you vary that and you get different results. And so the different models, I think there are 44 that I saw in one image. They go up something like this. These, all these models are going like this, right? They're all going like this. And this, I think there's one, something like this, but all going like this. So this is the most sensitive to carbon dioxide. And people say, oh my God, the sky is falling. We've got to do something fast. If we don't, it's, we're going to have a catastrophe because the temperature is going to go up so fast and you know, all sorts of bad things are going to happen. And uh, you know, sea, sea surface rise, you know, the thermometer, the, the fluid expands as it gets hotter, and that's what's happening in the oceans. You know, it's expanding. And if it goes like this, then we're just going to get inundated with water. And it's also going to melt stuff. And it's going to get inundated more, more, more. But then we have the least sensitive down here. Now, most climatologists who uh, are who care about their income, and their jobs, and their <laughs> positions, they have to toe the line here. They have to say this is right. If they don't, they're fired. They lose their, they lose their, they can't get work, they can't get uh, grants. It's a trouble. It's a big dogmatic kind of thing. This is the truth. 
but we usually say in science, we always say in science, the data is the truth, that's the reality. Then your model is a way to try to explain reality. So when the model uh, uh, is close to the, to the reality, then you say, okay, that model is a candidate for the truth. That's a, that is for a true explanation. doesn't mean it's going to be a true explanation. It might diverge another time. But we always want to match these things up. And so that's what's happening. So most, most people don't really know that. They just hear the news. So you've got to be a little careful. So scientific method says, well, let's match these up. And we've got to throw out this stuff up here. This is wrong. Well, how is it wrong? Maybe you don't know how it's wrong. Maybe the model's incomplete. Maybe the, uh, maybe the fudge factor is too sensitive. You know, the, the, I think it, it, the inc people are arguing now that it's incomplete. We're not accounting for the C interaction and the essentially sequestration of heat into the oceans uh, that's gobbling up this temperature you know, that would normally be up here. Well, that's, that may be true, but that just means your model, you don't understand enough to get at the truth. So, uh, uh, so this is, there's a big difference here and people are trying to struggle with this. I think the sincere, you know, uh, really honorable the climatologist saying, hey look, this is, and there's some people that are, I would call it dishonorable, which is maybe no other came up I can't believe it. They have a consulting group that said, oh the data isn't like this, we're going to do this and do that and look what the data does, the data now looks like this. <laughs> I said, what? And some people at the climate jobs in their space say, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you doing? People have, people have tried various scenarios to adjust the data so it matches what you believe. That's not science. That's, I don't know what that is. So uh, anyway, that kind of stuff is going on. So be aware. So you've got to come up with something. You want to have a good understanding. There's no question we have warming based on satellites, a very, 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 very um, reliable measure, so measuring devices, remote measurement, very reliable. So we're definitely at a high period over the past 300 years. It's been warming since 1600 in the Little Ice, you know, from the Little Ice Age. And we'll, we, it was warmer still before that than it is now. Greenland was green. So uh, we might be headed there, but uh, the question is, what's the cause? And then what do you do about it? Or can you do anything about it? Or you just have to adapt? Those are the questions that we all have to face. But that's another case where you have a big divergence between the models and the reality. And then you have to figure out what to do about it. Usually you usually have to change the model. You don't want to change the data unless you have a really compelling reason that satellite data is wrong. I don't, I haven't heard any, anybody come up with a convincing argument for some odd reason satellite data doesn't work it. Okay, so those are two kind of examples. So always, uh, as time goes on, you adjust your models and say, okay, if I were adjusting things or adjusting my model, I would say, okay, it's not very sensitive to carbon dioxide. Maybe the oceans are very sensitive. Maybe the, the life in the ocean is very sensitive to carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is going crazy, so we gotta do something about carbon dioxide. It's literally poisoning the environment. Not in the kind of normal way, it's not killing us, but it might be killing sea life at the bottom of the food chain. That's a big problem. That, I see, is a big problem. And when we're producing a lot of uh, energy for one reason or another. We might be polluting because they were spewing out thorium or some heavy metals that are literally killing people. That's the problem. Uh, those are the fo foremost problems. Uh, there are some insiders that uh, in, in the government are saying this is being driven by another agenda, some, some other agenda. This has become political science. <laughs> All right. 
Okay, so uh, in any case, uh, your observations should be tested, retested, see if they're verified. Other people have to verify your observations. It can't just be yours, but your observation may be very exciting. Right now in the, uh, in the area of physics, I just found this out a week ago. Uh, I could hardly believe what I read. Is that you know, the, the standard model of physics uh, proposed that there are four fundamental forces in the universe. And people have been trying to unify those forces, been very successful with, uh, you know, Nobel Prizes are handed out uh, for unifying the electromagnetism with the weak force and then grand unified theories that you know, unify those with a strong force. And, but people are trying to find a way to unify gravitation with that. But uh, somebody came out maybe, a, I don't know if it was about a year ago, with a, an observation that couldn't be explained by the, the, the standard model. And they thought, well, maybe it has something to do with dark matter, dark matter force, stuff like that. But uh, then another group said, no, it can't be that, and it can't be this. It, therefore, it must be a new type of force carrier. Therefore, a new type of force, a force, a fifth type of force in physics. And that, this is just happening now. So one person observed this, and one, per, one group uh, made some speculation based on that. So now a lot of people should be paying attention and trying to reproduce the, the results and, and seeing if the result was real or just an illusion. And then people will be trying to analyze it and understand this fifth force, if there really is one. It's really a remarkable thing. It'll just turn physics upside down. So science is evolving. Uh, Newton had a theory of gravitation and, and dynamics. And that was superseded by two things in the last century, uh, Einstein's theory of gravitation and quantum mechanics. Not just classical cl mechanics of particles and orbits and things like that, but that matter acts like waves on a very small scale. It, it, everything changes. It's, it's very, very. It, it is. You have to uh, confront your experiments with your models. See if they match. If they don't, make new models. That's how science. Well, science is always evolving. I suspect you know what we what we call uh, questions of religion today will be questions of science tomorrow. Uh, you know, so all sorts of things will understand, oh, there's another dimensionality of existence or something, and, and there's energy being interchanged with this universe, or you know, all sorts of stuff. People talk about parallel universes. There's all sorts of stuff out there. It's really, lots of mystery out there. And so science would, I would like to do science, you know, really get to the truth of phenomena, and even maybe pr get to the human psyche able to understand that better. We try to do it very roughly with psychology or psychiatry, but that's very, we, there's no math in there. There's no hard science. Really get to the hard science of prediction. We'll see. Okay. So observation leads to inferences that we make that the, some hypothesis that can lead to predictions, and we test that, and so on. If we have a lot of different, uh, if, if you test this one thing over and over, over, and it's true, over and over again, in a lot of different circumstances, that some uh, model might become a law, a law of gravity, or the law of dynamics. And if you have a whole bunch of laws all together that that uh, analyze things in one domain of knowledge, that becomes a theory. It's a little bit more general, maybe, than the use of the term theory. But this is very good. You know, this is, uh, this dynamic is, is very good. All right. Now, uh, I, I don't think we got here, but uh, last time, but. We can only see so much. 
because our pupils are so big, and you know, think of that. You know, our pupils are like little, a little binoculars. You know, binoculars with tiny little holes. You know, that's not much of a binocular. You can't see much. Uh, but if you get a binocular, then you can see all the light in two large, you know, kind of splotches there. And then that all can be converged with optics into your eye, and so you can see more light. With a telescope, you might be able to see that much light instead of that much light or this much light. So with bigger and bigger optics, you can see variety of them. You can see more of the light that exists there, and you can bring them into focus and see farther and farther and farther, more and more and more. Our, with our naked eye, we can see about 6,000 stars, and, and 3,000 is about half. Some of them are bright, some of them are not so bright. These, here's Orion, you'll see this in the, uh, in the winter time. Famous constellation, uh, uh, this is, uh, let's see, Betelgeuse and Rigel. These, if you see the stars have different colors. And temperature is, uh, causes color, it's just cooler, it's a little reddish, if it's uh, hotter, it's bluish, whitish. Here, these are the, the, the Orion's uh, belt, the very hot blue stars, Orion's sheath down here. So all this, and then there's Orion's nebula down here. So all this stuff is light coming. Uh, and, and, and here you really can't see, it, it doesn't look like this to your naked eye. This, this splotch here, you can see something with your naked eye, especially if you look to the side a little bit in your peripheral vision, you can see kind of a fuzzy patch. If you go to Yosemite or something at night, you can see it closer to this, but still kind of like a little smudge or fog. But if you, this is from taking light over a period of time with a telescope. You can let it sit there and collect light, collect light, collect light, and then close the shutter, open the shutter, maybe 30 seconds or a minute or 10 minutes. And then it, if you can track it right, it stays in focus, and you get this very bright stuff. You can see a lot of detail. So you need things like telescopes, binoculars, very helpful uh, to be able to uh, see a lot more stuff than you can with your naked eye. Now I don't know if you can pick this up or not, but if I'm looking on the on the lap on the computer over there, then you can see some speckling. There are tons of, and, and if you look at the directly at the image, there are tons and tons of stars in here. When, and this is, you know, using some telescope. Your naked eye can't see all these stars, but your naked eye, especially with light pollution, you can only see the brightest stars. Mm -hmm. uh, it says uh, stars are distributed random, randomly. Human brain tends to find patterns. Yeah, so we impose our view of what something is. Okay, there's a belt, and there's a there's a scabbard, and there are knees, and there's a shoulders, and there's a head, Orion the hunter. And do they know how far any of the stars for Orion belt is? Sure, uh, they know. I don't know. You know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, they, now, toward the end of this chapter, we'll start to get into how, how can you tell how far things are? Because this could be a dim star that's very close, or a very bright star that's far away, very far away. And actually, this looks like it's just on a flat surface, but really, it's a kind of three-dimensional thing. Let's say there might be a picture of that. Kind of effect here. Ah, here. So here's the stars for Orion. It looks like it's on a surface. We call that surface uh, the celestial sphere. But that surface is not a flat surface. Actually, when you look out, when then you get the distances, uh, these seven prominent stars are act actually out like this. And so if you took a, took a trip with a spaceship out through here to try to get to Orion and see Orion, it's not just on a surface, you, you, the whole uh, pattern of Orion would change. And it wouldn't look like Orion after a while. Then there's st stars over here and over there, and you pass one. Does that surface have like a specific name or word? Yeah, that's, that surface, I said, the, the thing that looks like it's out there and all the stars are fixed onto the surface is called the celestial sphere. 
that's very important in uh, you even, even though it, it's sort of an edifice up on which we construct the observational astronomy uh, but it's not like the surface of the earth which is pretty spherical on the surface and we have uh, you know, points on that surface of latitude and longitude but uh, here we also we project the latitude and longitude into things like right ascension and declination, and things like that. At the equator and north and south pole, the celestial pole out from the north and south poles of the Earth. Uh, but even though it's not a surface, it's very useful. How do you spell celestial sphere? C e l e s t i a l. R. You forgot the R in there. Is it celestial or celestial? Celestial. T l. Okay. I a l. <clears throat> oh, and, and this is uh, about a thousand light years. See, you get most of the stars are within a thousand light years. I was saying something more like this. Here you can see out, maybe out here, maybe within maybe a couple of thousand light years, but that's about it. The bright, the brightest star. The years we got some very bright one, very far away, but these are. The apparent brightness of these are all about the same. So that means their, their luminosity, their absolute brightness, uh, must be a little different for them to be at such different distances but still look the same to us. Here is the, this is part of the obvious view. Here's a celestial sphere upon which we draw the different constellations. So we, we have organized this sphere into patches of real estate, 88 patches. They are all contiguous, and the, the 88 patches cover all the celestial sphere. We call them constellations. Now, within the constellations, uh, they're named, and for example, Cassiopeia, the, here's the Dipper, and the Lyra, Virgo, all these different the names. Uh, there are these little patterns, like the Dipper, for example, that's a pattern. We call those patterns asterisms. Asterisms are famous patterns that we can sort of draw with stick figures, stuff like that, we recognize quickly. Uh, within the constellations, they just get the brightest stars of a constellation. Southern Cross is the four brightest stars within that, that area of the Southern Cross. Uh, Big, Big Dipper is part of a constellation called, anybody know? I bet you know. Big Dipper. The Big Bear. Milky Way. Very oh, Big Bear. <laughs> right. And then the Little Dipper is part of the Little Bear. The little Bear. Bear. <laughs> now these, these, these things have tons and tons of stars uh, at various brightnesses. And if you look at a star map, like we do in lab, in, in astronomy theory, uh, then you'll see, oh yeah, there are boundaries there. Or you can get a software program, a free software program out there if you're really interested, there's a uh, stellarium, and you can get an idea. You can show how many stars, you can get a lot of stars, or a little a few stars. Uh, you can do all sorts of stuff and see the boundaries of the names of the constellations, all that stuff. Okay, now. Away, so, so the Earth has poles, north and south, has an equator and projected out the, 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 where it intersects so this celestial sphere, sphere. It's not a certain distance away, but if we just put a sphere of a given radius way out there, then it would intersect these, these lines here. This equator would be a great circle. And the south and north celestial poles. And uh, maybe we mentioned the other day that uh, Near the North Celestial Pole, there's a star that doesn't move much, and everything sort of rotates around the star. And that star is Polaris. <coughs> now, how come uh, stars seem to rotate around Polaris? The North Star. Is it because it affects the top? Go ahead, Is it because it's exactly above? Well, okay, so it, it's almost exactly above the North Pole, but then all, if you look at the, say the North Star is up there uh, in the evening, and you, you start out looking very right now, it, in the early evening, the Big Dipper is back there, and the Little Dipper is up there, and you see 
Cassiopeia, the W over here. Those are pretty prominent. You can see those pretty well. But through the night, they rotate around that North Star. Yeah, okay, I think you got it. Yeah, yeah. where the Basically, axis point is? Uh, we, are we are the ones rotating under the night sky. And so there's an apparent motion. We, we see, oh, everything is still relative to us. But if you're looking at us and the Earth, the Earth is going around. So if you're sitting here looking up, oh, it looks like the sky is going around. That's a, a geocentric view versus a more enlightened view, uh, looking outside the Earth. So you see different constellations depending on like what season yeah, of the year it is? Yeah, that's right, that's right. Let's see if we can get it to get an idea. So certainly since you say at any given time at night, you're looking say at midnight uh, in the south, you see a certain constellation up there and then they rise and they set through the night. So, that, so we rotate under that so you see different parts. But then the night sky is the same in summer all the time for some period of time at least. And uh, then, the, the, then in another part of the, the year, we have, we have a summer sky, or summer constellations, like the, the tri summer triangle and Sagittarius, and, uh, I don't know, Libra, uh, Libra and uh, Scorpio, and things like that. But in the winter, we have, at midnight, we have Orion, we have 